Hello, welcome to the introduction to proofs video for countability on diagonalization. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The learning objectives for this video are, by the end of this video, you should be able to define uncountability of a set, and you should be able to apply Cantor's diagonalization argument to a list of real numbers, either finite or countable. Our motivation is that we've seen previously that a bunch of sets, like the naturals, the integers, the rationals, the naturals cross the naturals, these are all countable sets. And this leaves us with a pretty good question, is every set either finite or countable? Now, the answer is no, and we're going to see a reason why. In particular, we're going to see that the set of real numbers is both infinite and not countable. So we'll call this uncountable. And we're going to use a non-trivial technique called diagonalization. It turns out that in general, it's difficult to show that uh, there is a set, it, it's difficult to prove that a set is not countable. So we're going to see two techniques for this in this course. One of them will be diagonalization. We'll start with the definition of, a, of an uncountable set. A set A is said to be uncountable if it's infinite and not countable. Now, this definition tends to be somewhat confusing for people, and let me give um, some either heuristics or some intuition for why this, what this definition is about. So as an idea, we're going to think of finite sets as being extremely small. Finite sets are just much smaller than infinite sets. So you should think about finite sets as being extremely small. Countable sets are both small and infinite. So even though they're infinite, we're going to think of them as being small sets. Countable means small. And uncountable sets, we're going to think of them as infinite and large. So we're going to think about uncountable sets as being much, much bigger than countable sets. Now, this, can, this intuition can be formalized, and we're going to formalize it in the next slide. So if A is a countable set, and B is uncountable, then the cardinality of A is strictly less than the cardinality of B. This gives us a formal way of saying that uncountable sets are larger than countable sets. So let's go through the proof of this. This is going to be an informal proof, um, but it will have the main idea. So we know by definition that they can't be equal because uncountable and countable are different cardinalities. But the major question is, why is the cardinality of A less than or equal to the cardinality of B? So that, that's the big question we need to answer. And to do that, we need to come up with an injection from A to B. So since A is countable, we'll enumerate it as A1, A2, A3, A4, etc. We'll write it as a list. And now we're going to define an injection from A to B recursively. So let f of a1 be any element of b, just take one. b is infinite, so it has at least one element. f of a2 can be anything of b except for the number that you previously picked, or except for the thing that you previously picked. So another way of writing this is choose f of a2 to be a different element of b. We're doing this because we want f to be an injection, so we can't let it map onto the same thing. Now what should f of a3 be? Well, it should be anything other than the two previous things you picked. f of a4 will be anything except the pre previous four things you picked. In general, you'll always pick f of a n plus 1 to be something new, something that wasn't contained in the old stuff. Now, if we keep doing this, we'll define f of a n for all n. This is recursion. So we'll have a function from a to b. And will it be an injection? Well, you can note that for two different indices i and j, then f of a i and f of a j have to be different by construction. We always choose the, chose the later one so that it wouldn't contain the earlier ones. It wouldn't be one of the earlier ones. So f is an injection. The, this proof can be summarized as pick f a 1 to be anything, pick f a 2 to be anything new, pick f of a 3 to be anything else, and just keep on picking new things. And this will give you an injection. Now let's move on to diagonalization. So this is gonna be the main proof technique for this section. 
And rather than get into the proof first, let's look at diagonalization as a strategy. So suppose that x, y, and z are, are three unknown real numbers between 0 and 1. How can you find a new number a that is different from x, y, and z and is between 0 and 1? So think about a method that you could do for this. Well, here are some plausible methods that don't work. For example, taking the sum. Take the sum of the first three numbers. Well, that'll have to be different from all three of those. So won't that work? Well, it doesn't work when x is 0 0.1, y is 0 0.5, and z is 0 0.9, as the sum will be too big. So it won't be between 0 and 1. Even if you decide to, to cut off everything after the decimal point, you'll end up with 0 0.5, which might accidentally be in your list. So this method doesn't work. Another thing that students often suggest is take the average. Well, for these three same numbers, the average will actually be in the set already. So these two methods don't work for finding a new number on the list. Of course, they work sometimes, but we want a method that works all the time. The method that we're going to use is called Cantor's diagonalization. It's named after a mathematician, Cantor, and we've heard his name before. So before we get into the full power of diagonalization, let's look at an example of it um, for a list of three elements, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.9. So we write out our three numbers, and I've padded them with zeros at the end so that they all have three digits. And diagonalization says, take the first digit of the first number, the second digit of the second number, and the third digit of the third number. And our goal is to create a new number. So our number will start with zero point something. And now we want to guarantee that our number is different from x. So what should we pick as the first digit for a? Well, you can choose it to be whatever you want, so long as you don't pick one. So I picked two. Now, no matter what we do, however we add things on to a, we know that a will be different from x because the first digit of a is two and the first digit of x is one. x is 0 0.1 something, a is 0 0.2 something. So they have to be different. Now we're gonna choose the next digit of a and we're going to try to get it to be different from y. So we'll choose the second digit to be different from zero Let's choose it to be one. So now we know that a is not equal to y because the second digit of a and the second digit of y are different. This one's zero, this one's one. Now for our third digit, we'll use that third digit to be different from z. And again, you can choose it to be anything that's different from zero. Rather than choose one again, I'm just gonna choose seven just to show you that it doesn't have to be one that you pick. It doesn't matter what I pick here so long as it's different from zero so that I can use this argument. So there we go. This is the diagonalization method applied to these three numbers and it gives us as an output 0 0.217. There's many possible things it could give us but this is one of the things it gives us. And we know that that number will be different from the three previous ones. All right, now was that there anything special about a list of three elements here, or could we have done this with more elements? You can do it with more numbers, but you're going to need a longer list, more digits. So imagine that we started with only a, a list of four numbers, but we only had three digits. So we diagonalize on the first ones and say we pick zero point something different from zero something different from one, and something different from zero. Now we accidentally ended up with this fourth thing on our list. And if we wanted to be different from this fourth thing, we would need an additional digit to be different from Z. So take a moment to reflect. How many digits do we need to diagonalize a list with 2020 numbers? How many digits do we need to diagonalize a list with countably many numbers? Will this process always give us a real number between 0 and 1? 
and how can we formalize or automate the idea of choosing a different digit? Take a moment to reflect on those questions. Now let's move on to actually proving uh, the thing that we want using diagonalization. Let's prove that 0, 1 is uncountable. This theorem was originally due to the mathematician Cantor. Now, clearly the closed interval 0, 1 is infinite, so what we need to show is that it's not countable. So start with a function from the naturals to the closed interval 0, 1, and we're going to show that it's not a surjection. So therefore, there's no bijection between the two because there's no surjection from one to the other. And to show that it's not a surjection, we need to construct a real number a in that interval that's not equal to any of the fn's. Now here we're going to use diagonalization. So write out f1, f2, f3, f4, f5, write all of them in a list. So here I'm using these x11s, x12s, x13s. These are the digits of f1. So this is like 0 0.123 or something, or 0 0.141, things like this. Now, just like in the previous case, where we had a list of three things or four things, now we have a list of countably many things. But let's not worry about that right this second. Let's construct our real number a. It's going to start with zero point something. And this time, we need to make sure that we choose a digit that's different from x11. So as a placeholder right now, I'm going to say p of x11. And p will mean the function like take a digit that's different from x11. So if x11 is 7, take something other than 7. We're going to formalize this in a moment. Now our second digit of a will be different from the second digit of f2. It's called p of x22. The next one will be p of x33. And then we'll continue on in this way. So this a, we just need to be careful about what is this function p, this choose a different uh, value, choose a different digit. And here's one example of a thing that you could take. Take the function that goes from 0 to 9, from 0 to 9 to 0, 1, and define it to be p of 0 is 1, and p of everything else is 0. So this has the property that nothing gets sent to itself. So this is like a digit changing function. Many other functions like this could work. Now finally, let's check that the a that we've produced is actually different from all of these things. Well, for the same reason, the first digit of a and the first digit of f of 1 will be different, so a and f1 won't be the same, and in general, the nth digit will be different from f of n. a is going to be a real number between 0 and 1, but a won't be any of the fn's. So there we go, we've shown that it's not a surjection. Let's end with some reflection. What does diagonalizing a list produce? What is the role of the p function in Cantor's diagonalization proof? How did we know that a was not equal to f of 1 in Cantor's diagonalization proof? And wait, there are different sizes of infinity? What did we just show? Thank you very much and have a great day.